My name's Kiki Erickson. And I'm Thies Metzen. Maybe nationality? That helps. Okay, German. I'm, I'm German and Kiki is Swedish. And I'm Swedish. <laughs> Sorry, Kiki. <laughs> That's good. And you're citizens of the world. <laughs> yes, I think nationality doesn't rate highly here. When I was young, about eight years old, my uncle always gave me books about sailing, and one of the books were Wanderer 3's uh, sailings around the world. So Wanderer 3 became part of my upgrowing uh, when I was starting to sail eight, 10, 11, 12 years old. And eventually, uh, being 17, 16, 17, uh, I decided to become a wooden boat. When I had built a boat together with other boat builders and brought it down to Germany to present it to potential customers, um, Wanderer 3 once took the spot of a boat we had brought down to the German harbor of Kiel. And the end of the story is Wanderer was in the spot where our boat uh, was meant to be. I went to the owner to the then owner, a German, and uh, asked if I could come. It went down into its deep cabin, and we would be sitting there for five hours straight. A person I'd never met. We, we had found out, out that we had been in the Pacific, sailing in the Pacific, at the same time. He was wanderer, I'm with another boat. And so this lasted for five hours, and I left the boat, and he mentioned that he might, had, might want to sell the boat at one point. And that stuck in my mind. Five months, six months later, I returned to where I knew Wanderer was uh, moored during winter and left a note in, within the boat, which was opened, uh, that he, if he should want to sell the boat, he should actually give me a call. And he gave me a call. So there was no way back of not buying the boat. And that's how I ended up with the boat. She had been maintained uh, in very good fashion by the Hiscox and by Gisel Ahlers, who sailed around the world with the boat a third time. So Wanderer had done three circumnavigation by the time I got the boat, and she was just about 30 years old. And of course, a boat, a wooden boat, 30 years old, having sailed that much continuously, Needed, needed some work. So as a boat builder, I looked deep into her bilges and found quite a few things which were not, uh, not okay. And uh, the previous owner also had said that part of the idea of selling the boat to me was that he knew I would for once restore her to old fashion and would bring her out onto the oceans, because she is not a boat which should remain in the harbor or should just be in the marina. She, she is a boat which should be out there on the ocean sailing all the time. And that's how I, or Kiki and I, have treated her. We have kept her for the last 30 years sailing. And that's the extraordinary feat of this boat, having sailed for 60 years, more or less non-stop. I don't know of any other vessel having, having done this from Arctic to Antarctica over a whole range of oceans and latitudes in a mileage which I believe hardly any other boat uh, will match. I was handed that obligation to maintain her pelagic and to do that I needed to repair her. So I repaired her, repaired her in Denmark and uh, did the first of two repairs. Then I went out and sailed tw 25 years ago and continued what the Hiscox did, but in other regions, not only in the tropics, but in the upper latitudes, higher latitudes of the north, 
as well as in the south. So she has sailed through a wider range of uh, latitudes. The boat is a typically English construction. So she is built by rocker planking on steam bent oak frames, an elm keel, wrought iron floors. Everything copper fastened. So wrought iron and copper in warm ocean water is not a good, good combination which means that the wrought iron will decay, the flaws had given way, and eventually also there will be decay, delignification of the timbers, the steam bend frames. So whatever needed doing was down in the bilge. I had to change the flaws with bronze flaws for most of the part. For, uh, I didn't do the flaws below the must step because that seemed a big job at the time. And that I uh, followed, uh, I corrected and uh, made new when we did the job another time in New Zealand 20 years on. I met Wanderer 3 in 89. I was living in the Caribbean at the time. I had no idea that people lived on sailboats. I became friendly with people who were sailing a big Baltic trader and we were all going to go to a jazz concert and Teast at the time, unbeknownst to me, was building them a 13-foot lapstrake tender for them, a, a large rowboat, sailboat. And he came to this jazz concert as well. And that's how Teast and I met. And the next day, a group of us went sailing on Wanderer 3. And the rest is history. <laughs> when I bought the boat, um, I tried to make contact with Eric and Susan. Both were alive at the time. Uh, I'd never met them and I would never meet them uh, later on in life. Um, but we started a communication through letters, which I always looked forward to receiving. And uh, so through the early years, especially within the first two or three years, I always communicated with them and told them what, 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 what was going on with the boat, what I was doing. And they, in a very loving way, came back with little anecdotes about their reasons how they had the boat built. So why they put floors out of wrought iron and that they knew, ex they knew actually at the time that wasn't a good thing or the proper thing to do, uh, but it was the done thing in British boat building. So, and it would have been better with bronze floors, which they couldn't afford. And uh, so there, there came a lot of anecdotes and there was a lot of back and forth uh, between them and us. That a boat has such a story and has been taken care of for such a long time. Because she was pretty, she's beautiful and she has such a character. Uh, so you cannot but take care of a boat which has a beauty. She's just a, a boat which you would like to have. But the long longevity of the boat, of course, starts in the first building process. So the people who built it, Burnham and Crouch, the boat builders, did an excellent job, a fantastic job. Of the planking, I have replaced one, one or two planks, very, very little bit. Of course, I had to reframe her but that's due to age. But the building standard at the time by that yard were absolutely fantastic. And she had been built slightly stronger than originally planned. So the planking is a bit bigger, a bit thicker than originally drawn. And that has helped her to, to live, to, to, to do all what she is doing there. But it is a fantastic thing that a boat, a wooden boat, 60 years old now, has done 300,000 miles in, in ice, in, in the tropics, uh, in all oceans, up and down, in difficult situations. When we came back from South Georgia now, uh, have not pumped her for three months. There's no water in her. So of course we, I, we have taken care of it of her and everybody who had owned her has taken care of her. But you need a good substance right from the beginning, a good start, and you need beauty in order 
to to have a boat uh, live for such a long time and still have the capability to stand up in the south, southern ocean. So um, head head off for the builders at the time, definitely. Well, I think a lot of people, when they think about taking care of an old wooden boat, probably their hair raises up on the end and they think they would never want to do that. But I don't think it's that much work. We haven't hauled out in seven years. We hauled out in 2005 in New Zealand. And since then, we've done a lot of sailing in the high latitudes. She's seen a lot of ice. We've slapped some paint on the top sides in that time. Uh, we've careened twice, half careened, I would call it, because it wasn't really a big enough tidal range. Slapped some anti-fouling on the bottom in those last seven years. And the cockpit's still varnished. Um, the front hatch is still varnished. It seems to hold up really well. I don't think we do that more than once a year, if that. We're not super fussy about the gloss or the shine, or if there's a bit of a scratch in the varnish or a ding. Uh, she's, she's not meant to be something that you're scared of using because this is our home. This is our only home. This is where we live all the time. She's very strong. I don't feel I have to be precious with her. What I like about Wanderer when I sail her, let me think, everything's in arm's reach. <laughs> you can't fall far, that's for sure. Everything's manageable, you know, it's not huge sails. Although we do have tiny winches, but that seems to work as well. We've uh, managed just fine. Everything's cozy and tight. My favorite sailing is mainsail and Genoa on one side <laughs> and the jib boomed out on the other side. And it's just nice and easy and gentle. And that's my favorite sailing. And I think T sometimes says that's a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> what I do like about Wondra is um, that you can completely trust her. She looks after herself. You don't have to look after her. Um, she has brought us through tremendous storms. And you don't get nervous mm. uh, when you are down below because it's, she's a quiet boat. She sets into the sea very quietly, which I think is a, it's a major thing for your psychic to, to, to be relaxed down below in rough weather. Another character Wanderer has, which I treasure, is that she does soothe too very well. You don't drift very fast in a storm. You, you don't drift two knots or three knots. Some boats drift away. We, by most half a knot, so she, she stands up to it. And unbelievably for a 30-foot boat, uh, you, we can tack ourselves free in 45 knots. We have done that in 45 knots, 50 knots even from the coast. And she stands up to that. And we know that because we have, we have practiced it. And, and that is a wonderful uh, confidence which the boat's boat gives us. If a boat can install this in you, it's a wonderful boat. It's not a fast boat, Wanderer is by not the fastest boat at all, but 100 miles a day is our average. And we have many, had many passages where we had 5,000 miles, 50, 50 days, 3,000 miles, 30 days, quite regularly. Um, the bestest day sail we have had is 177 miles, so that's fast for us. Um, so she can move, um, but in general she doesn't move. It's faster than five knots. She's not a cutter, she's not a sloop. We have two four, four stays, an inner four stay and then a, a head four stay. So we can actually set two sails. I haven't changed the sail plans, even though a little, yeah, little, what is it called? Bowsprit. Bowsprit, yeah, <laughs> a little bowsprit would be excellent. And uh, she, it would help the boat to carry more sails. She could easily 
carry more sail, but uh, you don't change a boat like this. One, you just keep her like she is. One feature that she has that we find very useful and that the Hiscox made sure that they had is the uh, twin spinnaker poles. At the bottom, they're attached to the gooseneck fitting and then they're just pulled up against the spreaders. And they, of course, didn't have a wind vane. They did their two circumnavigations without a wind vane. And so they used this very much whenever they had downwind conditions. And we use it at the drop of a hat. We self-steering uh, at the time when the Hiscox sailed around the world, the first circumnavigations didn't exist. Uh, no autopilot, no wind pilot. Um, Blondie Hustler, who is the inventor of the wind pilot, um, actually put a wind pilot on his boat, Jester, and on Wanderer 3. So Wanderer 3's wind vane is the first wind vane put on a boat in the world. And the Hiscox sailed with this wind vane for the first time on their voyage to America um, the US and back to, 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 to the UK in 1965, I think it was. And ever, ever since, wind vanes have become a common thing. But it means that the Wanderer uh, initially had been balanced fantastically mm. uh, to sail around the world short-handed, two people. Cruising as we know it now is built up on the canvas covered decks of Wanderer 3. And that such a boat, 60 years on, is still doing it. And still doing it in cutting edge areas in a way. Uh, because bringing a boat of 30 foot and wood into the Antarctic is to compare with bringing a boat, a boat in the 50s through the tour motors. And that's what Vonra was. She was one of the first boats to sail through there with a the short-handed crew and she's still doing cutting edge adventuring on the ocean 60 years on and that's a testament to, to a boat. And so we came on up the dirty grey English Channel and as we approached the Isle of Wight we sent up on our flag halyards the flags of the 17 countries that we had visited during this voyage. Wanderer had been away from her home port for three years and three weeks. <laughs> 